very warm welcome to you here in Malmö. Thank you very much for coming to Malmö. And to you, I look down the barrel of the camera, to all you who unfortunately are not here in Malmö. You don't know what you're missing, but no. We're going to be with you, you're going to be with us, and we're going to be delighted to have you um, because you're going to be able to follow everything that is actually happening here in Malmö. So thank you, all of you who probably, like me, took the first plane in one or two or three years. Uh, some whose first trip it is, actually, in their job, but we'll come on to that. So uh, we're going to be talking about education, um, and it's wonderful to be joined by an expert, by speakers, and there is much to say. And one hour seems like a long time, but actually it's very little time. So I'm delighted that you could be here. Um, and to those of you who are joining us online, I'd like to invite you to press on a white button on your screen, uh, because you, the accredited delegates, will then get to forward questions to us or comments if you'd like uh, to make some. So please select the language, if you haven't already done so, that you are going to be listening to, uh, whether that is English, French, Spanish, German, or Russian. May I encourage you to tweet, if you wish, and that is hashtag remember, react. So you first remember, then you react. You don't react and then remember, because you might have to remember something that you regret. So let's hashtag remember, react. So as I said, we're together for one hour, and here's how it's going to work. There's going to be a number of short, I insist on the word short, three minutes prepared interventions by heads of delegations. We will also have short film clips, and they are absolutely also a vital contribution to this session because they are pledges. What is a pledge? A pledge is a commitment, a commitment made by a country. When you make a public commitment, you can be held to that commitment. And that's going to be very interesting to see who is pledging what. If you want to read the pledges more carefully, I understand they are online. So if you'd like to do that, you're welcome to do that. There will also be online interventions on this screen behind me by some speakers. So as the time is limited, as I said, um, we have many speakers. Uh, I'm going to ask our speakers to be very disciplined, I'm sure they're used to that, and um, to speak for just three minutes. You will have a clock. When it goes into the red zone, I'm not going to be a happy person because uh, it means you've got one minute to go, and I would really ask you, in order to allow us to have questions and reactions, we want it to be interactive, we want it to be solutions orientated. So it would be really helpful if you can keep it short. So I'll keep my remarks short. So by the end of the session, as I said, there'll be some questions and comments, which we hope you online will also, having pressed on your white button, will um, be forwarding to us. And during the first breakout session this morning, I really thought about what is our, your, my legacy? Ask yourselves the question, what has been my legacy so far? What is my contribution? As we look, as the minister this morning, Madame Ekstrom, was saying to us, Stockholm 20 years ago was about looking at the past. This is about remembering, honoring the past, but looking to the future. So let's focus on the topic of the session. It's entitled Preserving, that means safeguarding, keeping, testimonies, and developing education for the future. And it is by behaving responsibly, honorably in the present that we can better shape the future. So how can we ensure that the testimonies of survivors remain accessible and continue to be shared in the future? That is absolutely crucial that that work be done. As the French president was saying this morning, plus jamais, which means never again. And often in the United Kingdom, where I live, one of the sentences or three words that are used in remembrance are lest we forget. In other words, you know, what if, if we forget, we run a very big danger, a very big risk of repeating the mistakes of the past. So if we want to succeed, today's session is going to be about new and 
changing target groups, diverse forms and methods within Holocaust education need to be explored. How to do that? We're going to hear very different contributions helping us about that. Includes coalition building, and that includes lots of different sectors, which will be crucial. Civil society, experts, of course, and academics too. So we're going to explore actively in this session new practices and technology. Technology can help us to reach out and to make an impact. And first, I'm delighted to say that we have here our expert, and he has an extra minute than the speakers, so he's entitled to four minutes. If anybody's looking at this on your watch, he's our expert, Chairman Danny Dayan, Director of Yad Vashem. Yad Vashem, of course, internationally renowned, the World Holocaust Remembrance Center for Holocaust Education, Documentation, and Research. And research, as we were hearing this morning, there is not enough that is done, and that's why it was so interesting to hear this morning the work that has been done by the Gothenburg University. So from the Mount of Remembrance in Jerusalem, Yad Vashem's integrated approach incorporates meaningful educational initiatives, groundbreaking research, and inspirational exhibits. Dani Dayan, the floor. If, remain seated, unless you would prefer oh. to stand. Who am I to tell you to stand or to sit? No, no, you do okay. as you wish, express yourself and share with us your thoughts as we open this second breakout session. Thank you so much. Uh, it has an advantage to be seated here. I will be able to see the watch and know how I went to end my uh, intervention. Uh, excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we all know that we are uh, facing for some times the inevitable dwindling and eventual disappearance, unfortunately, of the survivor generation. Um, the survivors themselves uh, have been painfully aware of this and have therefore willingly, many of them, most of them, cooperated and even sometimes initiated the significant frameworks and tools for gathering and recording their memories and testimonies. Um, the eternal, uh, moral, and historical legacy of the Holocaust for humanity has been bequeathed to us by the victims and the survivors of the Shoah of the Holocaust. Uh, sometimes I am asked why it's so important to know every detail, why it's so important to research every single event and every single uh, killing by Nazi Germany and its collaborators. And my answer is that it's not only for pure historical considerations. I think it's a debt. It's a debt that we owe to the victims. I always think about a figurative young child from Bialystok in Poland, or from Rhodes, the island of Rhodes in Greece, the girl from Bialystok was crammed with her community into, a, into their synagogue and set a fire. And the boy from Rhodes or from Crete was taken in a rustic boat to Piraeus and from then in a train, in a cattle train to Auschwitz to be exterminated immediately in the gas chambers. And I believe that humanity, us, as more, we as moral human beings, owe a debt to those children, to those young persons, to those women, to those men, to, all, to those old persons, that we will know what happened to them. They will not be forgotten. We will learn lessons from the terrible events that happened to them. So, we should not forget, we talk a lot about collecting testimonies from the survivors and the fact that in a few years, unfortunately, survivors will, will, will be not for us, will be not with us, among us. But we also have, and probably is even more important, to recollect, to have, to gather information and knowledge about the victims that never had the opportunity to present to us with their testimonies. I am proud that Yad Vashem is the world's leading 
of obviously not the only one, thank God, repository and available resource for accessing that huge treasure of survivor and victim testimony and documentation. Now, we cannot deny that the, that the departing of the survivors from the scene will be, will be a meaningful challenge for us. But we should not, we cannot despair because of that. We have the means, and if we do not have the means, we will create the means to continue to gather information, to continue to disseminate information, even when those survivors are not among us. And I will say as a, to conclude, my friends, excellencies, in Judaism, there is a basic principle of free choice. There is a right thing to do and there is a wrong thing to do. But every single individual has the, pre the prerogative to decide whether he does the right thing or the wrong thing. We must decide to do the right thing and continue to gather information to be us, the witnesses of the Holocaust, when our survivors depart from being among us. Thank you so much. Denny Dayan, thank you so much. Uh, we hear the passion, we hear the, the responsibility with which you take this mission, a debt we owe to the victims. We need to collect evidence of victims, especially those whose testimonies were never heard. Powerful words to open this session. I think you will all agree, and I expect nothing less, I'm sure, from our next uh, speakers. That is a very big invitation, I think, a theoretical one, but a practical one, to come and see what uh, you are doing. And there we know that political will, I know that from as a journalist, is fundamental. Of course, work with NGOs. There are, I think, over 30 represented in this forum, 50 countries who have been invited by the Swedish government to be here. And this is why this is a, an absolutely unique, timely opportunity at a, at a time when anti-Semitism, racism, anti-Gypsyism, all those things are alive and present and need to be, the research is needed because if it's not documented, it's much easier to refute. And that's what is absolutely a vital mission that we're gonna talk about here. And technology can help with that as well. So thank you very much for that opening uh, statement and contribution. Now we're going to do, as this forum is indeed doing, in the plenaries, in the breakout sessions, uh, again, very much an inclusion by the Swedish government of getting very different partners around the table. So Minister of Foreign Affairs, European Union and Cooperation from España, from Spain, José Manuel Álvarez. Tres minutos, por favor. You have three minutes. Be a clock, I believe. There. So if you want some help on keeping to time, there we are. But we look forward to hearing what you want to contribute and say here today. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much indeed and congratulations to the Swedish government for this highly important international forum. The sufferers in Spain, the memory in Spain, has a symbolic date, the 5th of May, when the Allied troops um, liberated Mauthausen and they were received by Spanish survivors from there as well with uh, a hoarding that said uh, anti-fascist Spaniards welcome the liberating forces. It was written in English, Russian and Spanish. These people were part of the 10,000 Spaniards, Republicans, Sephardic Jews, uh, Romans, etc., who couldn't go back home again because uh, the Franco dictatorship denied them any form of rights. The testimonies of these people in uh, Nuremberg at the trials, as well as the photos that were taken at those times that they managed to hide, were used to condemn various Nazi leaders so that the 
world could see with their own eyes the, 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 the scale of the horror of the Holocaust. And they all swore before they left uh, Buchenwald and Mauthausen, they swore they would not forget the victims, that they would hold on to their memory so this horror could not be repeated again. To remember in order not to repeat. And as members of the International Alliance, uh, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, we are here to remember that today as well. There are various examples of what can be done and what Spain is already implementing in order to uh, remember and hold on to that memory of the Holocaust. First of course, foremost, we have to have the, uh, the establishment of the day that we've had since 2004 in Spain, to uh, a special day to uh, remember this. And there's also the question of people who were deported. We've been remembering them since 2019 in Spain. We can also introduce public diplomacy and teaching tools. Relevance, uh, relevance uh, in Spain is the uh, Israeli Sephardic Center, which uh, represents Spain internationally in terms of uh, remembering the Holocaust. We have to train teachers as well in order to prevent uh, anti-Semitism and uh, in questions of remembrance. We've got uh, over a thousand of these people in Spain, and uh, we've got the, the chairman of Yad Vashem here as well. We can we can support bodies like this as well and support young people through their education channels and also um, people have lost their nationality against their own will the uh, Spanish origin Sephardics as well for example we could reintroduce nationality for them as well so we have to uh, work to uh, combat anti-semitism as is being done by the IHRA so to conclude I think that people live in freedom um, they, they find it normal. Our rights, our freedoms, however, are won on a daily basis, and we have to do everything we can to learn the lessons of history. And uh, remembering is also uh, preventing. And so the Stockholm Declaration, with its values back in uh, the year 2000, really has led us in Spain, and we welcome the leadership being set at the Malmo, uh, Malmo Forum. And we have to Remember what was said by those Spaniards in Buchenwald and Mauthausen. Uh, remember in order not to forget and to not allow this ever to happen again. And that's what we have to continue doing. Thank you. A message, recordar para no repetir. Uh, lessons from the past uh, and to document the evidence, particularly since we're losing uh, the last survivors. But anyway, in order to not repeat uh, the lessons, the, the mistakes of the past. Thank you very much. Uh, Jose Manuel Alvarez, gracias. <laughs> Thank you. Now we go virtual. So on this screen, I'm told uh, Ethel Brooks from the European Roma Rights Center is going to join us. Let's believe and let's have it happen. Yes, you see, when you believe, it does happen. And it means trusting your team. And I do trust that team. So it's about finding people you trust to do your work. Okay, you have three minutes. Hold on, that's not fair. The clock is cheating. It says 2.47. That's not fair. No, no, you're getting three minutes. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm very sorry you can't be here in Malmo. It's rather nice. It's my first time. I definitely need to come back because I haven't seen much of the city. So I'm going to come back because the Swedes are just too lovely. But you're not here. You are there. And you are going to share your thoughts with us in this session. So, no, no, I'm told no, the sound is not sound happening. Just, just a moment, just a conference moment. Unlocked. unlocked. Can you hear me? Do you want to tell us hello? And let's see if we can hear you. Hi, I've got, Hi, I've got, I've got, a, got a bit of an echo. Oh, we're getting oh, we're echo. Getting Okay, let's give this a few seconds. This is live. This is what happens on television. This is not a game show. This is real life. We're going to try again. How long, Daniel, do you think that's going to take? We don't know. So we could go to our next speaker. And let's just try, let's say hello. Bonjour, bonsoir. Can you can you say something? Bonjour, bonsoir. I heard that. Did other Ça people hear it? It's working. You have the floor. Your three minutes okay. start now. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you so much. And, and really, um, my greetings to 
uh, the IRA and, and all of the delegations. My deepest thanks to the translators, and it is a pleasure to be with you. I wish I were here or there in person, but um, it's an honor to be here virtually. I want to begin um, by just giving a bit of a background and, and really thinking about, okay, so what does it mean to remember, to commemorate, and to fight for justice? As the chair of the board of the European Roma Rights Center, I want to say that we work and we pledge, according to our pledge, to remember the Pan Mila, the 500,000 or more Romani people who, alongside Jews, were the only two peoples targeted in the Nazis' final solution to rid the continent of our peoples. We want to commemorate those injustices done to us and the further years of injustice um, done by Europe in the denial of the Romani Holocaust. For Roma, the Holocaust did not mean the end of hatred and discrimination against us. The ideologies of white supremacy that led to the indiscriminate slaughter of our families, of our ancestors in the 1930s and 1940s, remain firmly embedded in European society long after the liberation from the concentration camps. The legacy of the Nazi race laws of propaganda, of persecution, um, the categorization of Roma and Sinti as undesirable lives on in Europe today. In every segregated community without water or electricity, in every Romani woman coercively sterilized, not just from 1935 to 1945, but until 2012, in every Romani school child segregated from her non-Roma peers, and in every Romani person beaten to death at the hands of the police officers who were just doing their job. This ideology is something that we are working and we commit, we pledge to disrupt. We pledge to agitate, to educate, to litigate in every way we can to ensure that the horrors of the 20th century are not continually repeated in an increasingly illiberal and institutionally racist Europe. We pledge to fight until we are no longer necessary as an organization, and Europe's Romani peoples are free to enjoy what most other European citizens take for granted, the freedom to live an ordinary life. And this is why testimonies are so important. As you know, and, and as you know, we, we all know, testimonies, survivor testimonies, are one of the few sources of non-perpetrator record of what happened during the Holocaust. These are, these are stories, right? But they're also witnesses for and, and with, right, the people who couldn't actually witness for themselves. They're the people who came through and who then were able to tell their stories. As a researcher and an educator, right, I'm a professor as well as an, uh, a European Roma Rights Center chair, I think that the use of testimony and the preservation of testimony, particularly when we're seeing um, the passing away of the survivor generation, is something that we need to hold on to and to continue. It's a way of connecting the stories of survivors with not just our generation the, or continuing generations, but across lines and, and really across kind of positionalities. And, and here I'm thinking to come back to that idea of an ordinary life one of the things that the survivor testimonies talk about and really show is how, you know, before the Holocaust and after the Holocaust, ordinary life, everyday life was something that they held precious. And that as they moved through, you know, in their families and, and in their everyday lives, they really brought the lessons of the Holocaust along with them. So how do we then take this witness of what happened, of the persecution, of, of the suffering, and then of the courage, courageous kind of post-Holocaust life and storytelling that survivors um, have carried through. How do we take that into the, the preceding generations and into the future? I think it's precisely through sharing it with our students at every level, right? When I share it with my university students, when I show them testimonies they can understand in a much deeper way what actually happened, and they can commit not just to passing on that knowledge, but also to working to make the world a better place. Ethel, thank you very much when indeed for this testimony. I hope you can hear me. Um, 
It's, it's very important. I'm afraid we're constrained by time, and time is against us. I hope the speakers who are present here will forgive me. I've um, let you speak for longer uh, than they have been able to speak. No, no, that's fine. I'm not, I'm not. And we hear. I don't have the timer in front of me, so that's, that's perfectly, why I had no idea. It's not idea, a criticism. Thank it, you. It's not a criticism. We heard your powerful testimony. We hear you talk about pledging to agitate and litigate. That was very clearly, I think, heard and understood. And we hear your fight for justice. And I think what the Malmo Forum in this session was about is very much recognizing that we're here to talk about anti-Semitism, but we are also here to talk about anti-Gypsyism. You have done that for the Sinti Committee, for the Gypsy community. We thank you, and hopefully there will be other occasions during the presidency of Sweden in 2022 when you can do that again, and who knows, maybe even longer. But meanwhile, thank you very much indeed for your testimony today. We heard it. It will be online. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now um, we go to President Stevo Pandarovsky of North Macedonia. I understand you're kindly going to be speaking in English. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being so... Is it working? It's okay? Yeah, it Thank you for being so generous in giving us a plenty of time to speak about such an important topic here. So I will try to stick to three minutes. And uh, best regards to everybody and to the organizers of this conference, very important one, for having me on this panel. I would like at the very beginning uh, briefly to spell out a free uh, f a, f a few of the historical facts about my country and especially about the atrocities which happened during the World War II on the territory of what is today uh, the Republic of North Macedonia because a lot of atrocities happen, happened and uh, I think that the world should know more about that. So 7,144 Jewish people have been taken out from what is today the Republic of North Macedonia and uh, transferred to Treblinka. All of them have been killed there. It was, if you are speaking about that ugly percentages, 98% of the whole Jewish population living in that region, in that part of the Balkan at that, at that period of the time. I'm speaking about 1943, when all of these people have been taken out and uprooted from their, from their homes. According to some relevant historical sources, it is probably, unfortunately, the highest percentage percentage in Europe, throughout Europe, of the Jewish people being taken and killed in the concentration camps. 98% of all people, of all Jewish people living in what was then one of the provinces in the, in the former Yugoslavia. Uh, in memory of all of those people, in 2011, we have erected a monument, Memorial Holocaust Center in our capital, in Skopje. And I can tell you that thousands and thousands of people have been passing through these halls and learning firsthand about the atrocities done by the Nazi Germany and their regional allies at that period of the time. So, but that is not obviously not enough for us. And my government, my state, state has decided to make few pledges for this conference, for this period of the time, and we are going to proceed, of course, thinking about few more pledges being done in the near future. The first one, we are going to expand lessons on Holocaust and on anti-Semitism in the final grades of the primary schools. Today it is more or less optional, but it's going to be the mandatory for the final grades. Second, we are going to make visits to this center, I have mentioned Memorial Holocaust Center in Skopje, mandatory for all people, for all kids, for all students being in the primary and secondary schools. And the third pledge is, my government has already adopted the working definition of the International Alliance. We are by the way, to say that we are asking for the mem full membership in, the, in this alliance. We are now with the status of an observer. We have already adopted the working definitions on anti-Gypsyism and discrimination against the Roma people. I don't know what to do with the five remaining seconds. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much for the pledges that you have made here today. And I'm very glad that I think the minister and the government of Sweden and Malmo Forum will be extremely uh, happy to hear. There is no doubt that in life, a deadline, an event, a conference, a lot of us hate deadlines, but the fact of the matter is, I can put my hand up, is I relate to deadlines. Because if it's got to be done, it's got to be done. 
And as for the last five seconds, you may think that that was a throwaway sentence, but I would suggest that humor, actually, when done with sensitivity, can defuse a situation rather than inflame one. We can talk about it later, maybe over a glass of something. So thank you very much indeed for your contribution, uh, Stevo Pandarovsky. And now we move swiftly to Albania. I'm afraid I didn't get a chance to speak to you, sir, before we started. Uh, Edi Rama, uh, Prime Minister, and I gather you're going to be speaking in English as well. And if I may yeah. ask you to respect the three minutes. Thank you very much, sir. I'll do my best. Uh so we have a different story, I would say, because uh, Albania is the only country in Europe that ended the war by having more Jews than before the war. And as a matter of fact, became a safe haven for the Jews. Um, and even before that, we were among the very few countries, uh, in my knowledge, uh, that since 1932 have, uh, have uh, legislated the right of the Jewish community to worship. Uh, and so Shabbat was uh, in the law and uh, nor the public, either the private sector, could uh, penalize any member of the Jewish community for not going to work in the day of Shabbat. Uh, there are, there are incredible stories of this Jew salvation. Uh, there are many, many, uh, let's say, discussions about how it happened, why it happened. We strongly believe that it comes from our common law in the Middle Age uh, that uh, has in the center God and the traveler as, uh, as the... Um, a real owner of the house of the Albanian. And uh, there is a whole chapter about the knock at the door and the obligation to open the door and to accept whomever is behind the door as your guest of honor for the time being and to offer him whatever help he is asking. Uh, so there are many stories and I would uh, just uh, tell you one of them, uh, which is about the collaborationist government, so the government that was put in place by the Nazis, uh, that was called uh, together with the religious leaders to, and we have four, because we are Muslims, uh, Christian Catholics, Christian Orthodox, and another uh, different uh, group of Muslims that are basically uh, autochthonous, the Bektashis. So they were convoked in Berlin in between 1943 and 1944, to, make a, to, to sign an agreement uh, about two issues. The gold of the central bank that was already uh, reserved in Italy and the list of Jews. And uh, they signed the gold, not the Jews. Even for the collaborationist government, it was impossible to do this because uh, in our common law and then in our tradition, there is nothing more dishonorable than to betray your guest. So, uh, five in five seconds, I would uh, give to the honorable gentleman here something that he would like. Uh, based on uh, the Yad Vashem uh, inventory, uh, there are uh, practically, there are uh, 2,265 2, Jews uh, in the list of people that were in Albania and were saved in Albania. And this uh, is uh, back in 2004. We have here the new one. Uh, we have made a lot of research and the distinguished professor behind is uh, the top guy dealing with the Jewish issue. And uh, I'll give it to you. It's all based on documents. So there were, in fact, 3,750 names. And uh, these were all... Uh, Look at the camera. Yeah, sure, we yeah. can take, but uh, she has the seconds. No, so, no, no, uh, no, 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 no. Please, ah, okay, please, good. please, that you has to You want to, to come with us? No. no, no, it's more about you. Okay. It's not about okay. me. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Prime Minister. Wow, I, that was an I unexpected moment. The and these things a, happen. They happen in, in life. I didn't know it was going to happen. It's not a fix. Yeah. That actually just happened. I think we can applaud that because, I mean, that's, wow.
You're full of surprises because I, I hadn't had a chance to talk to you and I didn't know it. What a beautiful surprise. Thank you so much. That is very, very special. And what an example to set. Uh, Prime Minister, thank you very much indeed uh, for, for that concrete action. Appreciate it very much. Now let's quickly go to two pledge films. One is from Hungary and the other one is from the Chief Operating Officer of a name that will be familiar with you. Social media mean anything? TikTok, Vanessa Papas, Hungary, and then TikTok. Never has the government of Hungary done so much for the Jewish community as in the past 12 years. The government aims to preserve and support Jewish culture and communities, and as part of this, it has a cemetery reconstruction program, and it has also launched a program to reconstruct synagogues. The government of Hungary is committed to the principle of zero tolerance against hate speech we can say that there is a certain kind of Jewish renaissance going on in Hungary, commissioned by the government of Hungary. We all have a role to play in stamping out anti-Semitism. For our part here at TikTok, we pledge to put our full strength behind keeping TikTok a place that is free of hate. We will elevate the voices representing the Jewish community. We will harness the power of TikTok to educate our community, and we will continue to invest in our technologies and teams in the fight against anti-Semitism. Our goal is to eliminate hate on TikTok, and we are committed to that for as long as it takes. Thank you. Okay, so that was Hungary and TikTok. Um, I think we can all agree that social media is slightly important in our lives, let alone in the younger people in our lives. Uh, but of course, we also are part of that. So we are lucky to have with us, actually, someone else from TikTok, and he is called Theo Bertram. I haven't spoken to him either. Um, you snuck in there. You are Director of Government Relations and Public Policy for Europe. Welcome. You are very welcome here. And I know how much the Malmo Forum wanted social media to be present because it's part of the solution, but it's sometimes, frankly, part of the problem. I'm really interested to see what you're going to say in three minutes. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. And we're very grateful to be here today. Um, for those of you who aren't on TikTok, I'm sure many of you already are on TikTok. TikTok is a video sharing platform with more than a billion users. Our mission is to inspire creativity and to bring joy. And as Vanessa said in that video, we have three pledges that we're making today. The first is to eliminate anti-Semitism from our platform. We are a young company but we joined the Code of Conduct on, to tackle hate speech in Europe in 2020. We were tested on that for the first time last week, and I'm pleased that the results from the European Commission praised us for our achievements in that test. But we know that we have a lot further to go. And we remain humble about that challenge. The second pledge that we're making is because we know that tackling anti-Semitism is only one part of the challenge. And a second part is around how do we educate uh, the people on our platform? How do we help them understand um, anti-Semitism, but not just anti-Semitism, how do we help them educate about the Holocaust? One of the ways that we're doing this already is that this year in the UK, on Holocaust Memorial Day, when you open the app, every single user who opened the app was shown, first of all, before they could see anything else, a video about the Holocaust that we created with the Holocaust Educational Trust and with other NGOs. That video was seen 26 million times just in that one day. So there are things that we can do on our platform to lift up and, and to, uh, to promote and, and educate our users. The third pledge is that we want to lift up and celebrate Jewish voices on our platform. And my favorite example of this is a woman called Lily Ebert. And I would encourage you to go on TikTok, to download TikTok and search for Lily Ebert. I'm sure you've seen lots of creators on TikTok who are sometimes funny, sometimes moving, sometimes uh, uh, profound, uh, and sometimes just authentic themselves. And Lily is a 97-year-old Holocaust survivor who has 1.4 million views. And she makes videos with her grandson, Dov. And it's there and it's presented in a way that our users really respond to. It's been viewed millions and millions of times. And it's, it's authentic. It's just how our users, the generations using our platform, want to connect with and learn about the Holocaust and about the Jewish community. So those are the pledges that we're making today to eliminate anti-Semitism, to promote an education about the Holocaust, 
and to lift up Jewish voices on the platform. And I'm also here today to make sure that I can listen and learn and be inspired from all the stories that I've heard today. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, please do. Well, I think using the word humble, you are humble, is a very interesting word coming from TikTok. We all heard it. And thank you for what you just said, that you are open. So I would hope that anybody in this room who wishes to speak to Theo afterwards, that you can engage in the conversation. I hope you've been having interesting conversations, and I hope you will continue to have in this room and outside. And that's very important. We, you need to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Thank you for being here today. Uh, okay, we move quickly, virtually, and I understand that we've got the President Harriet Schlieffer of the American Jewish Committee. Magic wand or not? Yes. Excellent. The floor is yours. Three minutes, starting now, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. I wish I could be with you, but I'll have to send my message remotely. My appreciation goes to Prime Minister Lovien for convening this important gathering, marking the anniversary of the path-breaking Stockholm Conference on Holocaust Education and Remembrance. Two decades ago, Prime Minister Pearson recognized that knowledge of the Holocaust in Sweden and in much of the world was woefully inadequate, and significant measures were required to reverse this trend. The results of those initial efforts were considerable. For Sweden, it meant the publication of a brief history of the Holocaust and its distribution to every household in the country, as well as establishing a center for Holocaust education and research, the Living History Forum. Beyond Sweden's borders, it led to the creation of a new international governmental organization, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, or IHRA, which now brings together over 30 countries fully focused on this mission. In these 20 years, we have also seen the establishment or expansion of Holocaust museums around the world. We commend the Swedish government for including in its own commitment pledge today its intention to build a Holocaust museum in Stockholm. These are significant, positive developments, and we applaud you. And yet, we face strong headwinds. While recent surveys conducted in Europe and in the United States show considerable support for teaching the Holocaust and its lessons, they also reveal a lack of knowledge about the Holocaust among a large percentage of the population. Most distressing is that today's younger generation is ignorant about its most basic facts. There is obviously so much more to do. Today's session focused on the importance of survivors' firsthand testimonies and how they can be preserved and employed in our collective education efforts. I am the daughter of Holocaust survivors. I grew up with these testimonies. They are the stories of my immediate and my extended families, of those who perished in Treblinka in the Holocaust, and those who were fortunate enough to survive and rebuild their lives in America, in Israel, and elsewhere. Their message of remembrance also and always had a dual purpose. We must be vigilant against the presence of anti-Semitism, however innocuous it may seem and in whatever form it may take. As Holocaust historians remind us, the Holocaust did not begin with death camps. It began with words. Unfortunately, in the 20 years since the first Stockholm Forum, we have witnessed a resurgence of anti-Semitism, first in Europe, and now in the United States as well. At the UN conference in Durban in 2001, yeah. we saw the revival of Zionism is racism canard. Shortly thereafter, Jews in Western Europe were under siege. Jewish communities suffered lethal attacks from Islamist terrorists 
and right-wing extremists. Anti-Semitism crosses the political spectrum. It does indeed, it Harriet Schleffer, and I'm very sorry, but you've crossed the time threshold by quite a margin. I'm extremely sorry, and your powerful testimony... And that was fine. Your powerful testimony has been heard and is there on record. And I thank you very, very much. And I'm very sorry that we can't give you more time. That is fine. Just know that American Jewish Committee will continue to work with you, with the conference, and we will get things done. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very action-oriented <laughs> conclusion. I thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. And now we're extremely happy to have here the United States Deputy Secretary of State for Management and Resources. I understand it is uh, your first trip since abroad, since you have got the post. Congratulations on getting the post. Congratulations on coming to Malmo. Good choice. Brian McEwen, the floor is yours. And as you know, I think we all know you have three minutes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the government of Sweden for having us here and thank you for putting us uh, in this conference. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to represent the United States and the Biden administration. Uh, our secretary this morning made a number of pledges. I'll briefly repeat them. A million dollars to counter anti-Semitism, hate speech uh, online in the uh, Middle East and North Africa. In Central Europe, support service and its global task force against denial and uh, to expand our International Visitor and Leadership Program, which is our signature exchange program uh, to confront anti-Semitism and Holocaust distortion uh, with visitors from the Middle East, North Africa, Europe, and Latin America. Uh, and since I'm effectively the COO of the State Department, as long as the Congress funds our budget, I commit that we will f see these pledges through. So I think we have a common theme here um, in both preserving testimony and wanting to tell stories. And Mr. Diane uh, spoke to it very powerfully that uh, six million is a number, but behind each of those six million people is a story of, uh, of an individual who suffered greatly, uh, but also as Prime Minister of Sweden said yesterday, never saw another birthday, never experienced another wedding anniversary or, or the joys of getting married and never experienced uh, getting to old age and having grandchildren and passing on the legacies to future generations. And we've lost inventions, we lost music, we lost possibility. And so as, as this generation dies out, we need to very much work to preserve their stories and tell their stories because it's through telling of stories that education uh, for future generations will come to life. For my own part, uh, reading the Dyer Van Frank as a young child was very powerful. As an adult visiting uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau and seeing a display case of um, suitcases that were left at Auschwitz, it sort of took took the breath away of myself and my wife. Uh, so it's that's how we will get to people, and we need to meet people where they are. So it's encouraging to hear uh, from our TikTok representative uh, the stories that they are able to tell through their pl platform because that's where let's be candid a lot of young people are today so we we need to encourage that kind of innovation uh, both in governments and the private sector we've got wonderful museums around the world in my go in my country in Israel now a new museum coming to Sweden but with it with technology we can expand the possibilities for people to visit these museums even if they can't travel to these wonderful cities. So we just have to be creative and innovative about how we tell people's stories because that's really the most important mission that we're all taking on here. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. We need to meet people. Yes, please. That sentence, we need to meet people where they are. Yeah, we need to meet people where they are. Not where we would like them to be, but where they are. That is so, so important. Thank you so much for those words of wisdom, which I think can almost serve as a conclusion. We just have one more pledge film. It's very short. It's 41 seconds long. I'll let you into that secret. It's Jonathan Greenblatt, who is the CEO of Anti-Defamation League. Roll tape. Our pledge is to share ADL's first ever digital education product about anti-Semitism for high school students with our partners around the world. We want to do this because I believe it addresses the number one concern 
that I know I've heard from Jewish communities far and wide that people simply don't know about Jews or Jewish identity and practice, and that that vacuum, that gap in information is often filled with anti-Semitic stereotypes. I believe with this program, we can finally solve that problem and do it at scale. Do it at scale, yeah. Not enough people know about it. So you need to know that discussions here today in Malmo are going to feed the forthcoming work on remembrance uh, on the Holocaust and combating anti-Semitism. For those that are members of the IHRA, IRA, the pledges will be followed up during the Swedish presidency of the IRA beginning in 2022, which is not long to go now. Please help me to thank our excellent speakers. Uh, a very special thank you to the interpreters again, and a very special thank you to somebody, two, well, three people there, Daniel, uh, and Sia, and Camilla, who has absolutely helped me to prep. Thank you very much indeed for that. Now, I invite you to go to the plenary that is going to be starting shortly. Uh, thank you very much indeed for making new pledges and really taking this in the serious way. Let's help to make a better future for us and for the generations to come. Thank you so much for being here in Malmo and being here today.